Okay, welcome everybody. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman. And uh, in this third video, in this six part video series on Carlsbad structures, we're going to now look at more unconventional ways that white can play in this Carlsbad structure. Methods that some of you might have never heard before of uh, not the typical minority attack. And those involve challenging the center or even attacking the king. So let's buckle up and let's start looking at some games. And who not better to start with than the great world champion Gary Kasparov. So here Kasparov starts with d4, knight of 6, c4, e6, knight c3, d5. And Anderson, by the way, is a strong grandmaster, Swedish grandmaster, who was always one of the best defenders ever. C, D, E, D. So he was very hard to beat. Bishop G5. And now C6. Queen C2. Now the point of Queen C2 instead of playing E3 first, by the way, is that black can then play Bishop F5. And after Queen F3, Bishop G6. And after Bishop takes, 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 black can try to play this endgame. And uh, obviously this endgame is not to everyone's taste from either color. So in this game, Kasparov avoids that and plays Queen C2. Now, granted, Queen C2 also allows some additional options for Black, some interesting options. But basically, if you want to play a very interesting game, Queen C2 is a very interesting idea. Now, Bishop E7 was played. E3, Knight D7, Bishop D3. And now we're in a typical Carlsbad. But now notice after castles, Kasparov did not play the typical Knight of 3. Instead, you played knight e2. And now you think, why would you do that? Isn't the knight better placed on f3? Doesn't that have more scope there? But it turns out knight e2 has its own pluses. And this game is a very interesting game that Kasparov won, which basically could inspire a lot of you to even play with the knight on e2. Basically, I think it's a matter of taste. Some people like to play with the knight on f3, which is a little bit more positional in some ways. Some people like to play with the knight on e2. This could potentially be more dynamic. So, and why is it dynamic? Well, we'll see. So, rook e8, same kind of idea. Castles, knight f8, and now f3. Well, that's the whole point. Now, white wants to challenge the center with the move e4. The idea was to play f3 so that the knight does not block the pawn from going to f3. So, f3, bishop e6, and um, black's just developing normally. And now white played rook a1, just preparing. He doesn't want to play e4 right away, perhaps, because of an idea like takes, takes, and maybe knight g4 might happen. And also, in some cases, c5. And here, e3 is unprotected, and maybe black is getting more counterplay than he should get. So therefore, white plays rook a1, which is very interesting. There's also rook a d1, basically trying to prepare the whole idea of e4, because e4 for now is not running away. So let's see what black does. He played rook c8. Now black's idea is since white's just going to challenge the center and uh, white's king is a little bit weakened. So that's the one drawback of this system. So black is going to try to play with c5 at some point. That's the idea. So that's why king h1 was played to get out of any possible dangers on this diagonal. Let's say a7 to g1 if the bishop ever gets here. Knight d7 was played, takes, takes, and now knight f4. Still not playing e4, still trying to just improve white's pieces to the maximum. Black played rook c7. Now he doesn't want to necessarily play c5 too early because then the d5 square will become quite weak. And c5 right away won't necessarily do much. So if he wanted to play c5, he probably should try to do that without exchanging the bishop. But anyway, it's c5 has its own drawbacks. Rook c7 was played. Now queen f2. Now the point of that is, okay, queen is just nicely solidly placed here away from any kind of line opening up and also keeping an eye on the d4 square if black ever plays c5. So notice how Kasparov, before he goes for decisive actions, he plays very prophylactically. He makes sure he puts his pieces in optimal squares and basically tries to kill opponent's counterplay. Knight f6 was played. And now finally it's time, e4. All of white's pieces are basically perfectly placed. So now it's time to break. e4, d takes, f takes. Now if black does not take, then e5 will come and white will really 
have a very strong center. Then the knight will move so somewhere and then f4, f5, white's gonna have very strong play. So takes, takes, and now rook cd7, trying to get counterplay, at least maybe this pawn is a little bit softened now. But white has it all figured out. He played a very strong move, d5, sacrificing a pawn temporarily, and after cd, he played bishop b5. And now it turns out that there are problems tactically with the rook on d7. So black had to go rook c7, there is no other good square, otherwise it gets forked. And now finally ed. And again, black cannot take on d5 because he's gonna get overloaded. Or rather, he will get just pinned. Something like rook d1, and there's gonna be problems with this bishop. Perhaps takes first, rook takes, and then rook d1. But anyway, it doesn't hold. So therefore, black had to go bishop d7. And now white just goes back. d6, of course, is not very effective because rook takes e1. Intermediate move, threatening this. We check. So that's why bishop back. But now white has this very strong pass pawn. And it's quite hard to blockade it because the d6 square for now is really not under control of blacks. So black went back. Keep in mind also in some cases a7 pawn is hanging. Queen takes a7. b6. Queen back. So white won a pawn. And now black has to somehow gather counterplay but of course it's not quite enough because white's pieces are all very good and in fact white strikes first he plays d6 opening up the square d5 for his knight so takes knight d5 rook e5 queen takes b6 knight f5 takes takes and now white's just simply up a pawn the smoke has basically cleared and white has a technical winning position up a pawn with better pieces and two very strong Connected pass pawns right here. So white played bishop d3. Takes, takes. Knight g6. And now he just pushes the pawn. Knight d4. a5. King f8. And now he traded this knight. And now he just went rook d1. So that he wants to trade off this bishop also. Knight e6. Knight b6. Bishop c6. Takes, takes. B4, and of course, white's up a pawn, so he's happy in general with trades, especially that he has two very nice connected pass pawns. Knight comes here, b5, and black just resigned. Because the pawns are going to be unstoppable, and probably black is going to have to give up a piece. In fact, this bishop now is out of squares, because it doesn't even have a square along this diagonal, and if he goes bishop b7, a6 will just attack the bishop. So black is lost, so he resigned. The next game I want to show you guys is the game between Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. And we've seen that a lot in these videos, didn't we? Carlsen against Nakamura, the two big rivals. And again, Carlsen's white in this game, and let's see what happened. So d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e7. So here black tries to play bishop e7 to not allow the typical Carlsbad structure with the bishop on g5. So C, D, E, D, and now at least there's no bishop G5. So white can't quite have his own way here. And now white plays bishop F4. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that after knight F3, C6, black's actually going to be fine because white does not necessarily have a very useful move because black's going to go knight F6 and it's going to more or less equalize. So this is considered fine for black. So that's why white played bishop F4, C6, queen C2. And queen c2 is played because if e3, then one of the main moves is bishop f5. So he does not want to allow that, so he plays queen c2. And now black played uh, bishop g4. I'm not sure if it's the best move. I mean, he's trying to get the bishop to g6 and trying to solve the problem of the bishop that way. Theory considers bishop d6 to be more common. Takes, takes, e3, queen g6. I think it was actually Ponomario who played with black this position, but anyway, there have been a lot of other games. The point is that black's usually doing more or less okay here. And there possibly are other moves, but uh, yeah, bishop g4 was played in the game, which I think is playable, but I think Hikaru Nakamura misplayed it after e3, bishop h5, bishop d3. So he traded the bishop, but the drawback is, of course, that it's a little slow. Trades, trades castles 
So he decided to create him double pawns because that could be a very important target for white for a future attack. And you might be thinking, what attack are we talking about? Well, the idea is, where is black going to castle? It's going to be hard to castle queenside in a structure like this. Simply because the queen side for black is a little bit weakened and it's just hard to imagine how the pieces are going to get out comfortably to allow castle queen side. Not to mention this bishop controlling this diagonal. Most likely black is going to have to castle king side and then white's going to have a nice target. So black played knight of six. And now f3, once again, the same idea. f3 with the idea of e4, challenging the center. Knight d7, knight e2. And now perhaps it was black's best chances to play move knight h5 here. And then maybe he's fine. So perhaps a knight e2 wasn't the most accurate move. Maybe he should have started with e4, but these are details. I just wanted to show you ideas. It's not a theory class here. So b5. And now after b5, e4 was played. b4, knight a4, d, e, f, e, and queen a5. Okay, so on first glance, black looks fine. It looks like he's already started some counterattack on the queen side, whereas black still looks relatively safe. So white played king b1, a useful move, seeing what black does. Now, okay, castle and queen for black is for sure out, and obviously the king cannot stay in the center for too long, because then it's just going to be hard for black to find a good thing to do. He eventually castled, because at this point it seems, well, nothing scary seems to be happening, right? Well, wrong. White's playing h4. Why is a wing attack good in this position? Because white has control over the center. And whenever you have more control over the center, chances are a wing attack might be in your favor. So that's something to keep in mind. Another rule to keep in mind is that very often wing attacks are met by counterattacking in the center. But here it's much harder for black to counterattack in the center. That's why the wing attack here has a good chance of success. And in this game, it succeeds. So rook f e8, e5, kicking out the knight now. Maybe knight g4 was the best try, even though I'm not sure if that holds. But black played knight d5. And now white just plays h5. Who cares about this bishop? It's not that great of a piece anyway. g5, and now white just played h6. Because if black takes the bishop, white's going to break through and break through. And it's going to be pretty much made. So black had to play g6. And now white just played bishop c1, solidifying everything. Now that white made a lot of concessions in black's camp, black played knight b6. Now knight c5. He doesn't want to trade. Of course, he does not want to open up the line for black. That would be a very bad idea. So knight c5, bishop takes c5, d takes c5. And now black played b3, trying to desperately create counterplay. Because if knight d7, e6, rook takes e6, knight d4, rook e8, knight takes e6, it would also be quite bad for black. This is a sample variation. White's of a piece. So black can play better, but in reality it doesn't really hold. And rook f6, of course, is met by bishop takes g5. So therefore black decided it's time to desperately try to create counterplay. But now after queen takes b3, queen takes c5, knight d4. Rook takes c5, knight f3. Well, now black make a mistake, rook e2. Rook f5 was more tenacious, but black still desperately trying to create counterplay. But that falls short because white has this very strong pawn on h6, and black has also a weak king. And the f7 pawn is also weak, whereas white's position is very well protected. So queen e7, queen d3, rook df1 is the idea, rook af8, rook df1. Black played f5, and now g4, knight a4, trying to desperately create something, but a little too late and dollar short. And white plays a strong move queen d4, threatening the knight and threatening basically mate. So black had to go there, nice try. And now white took an e5, which was correct, because queen takes a4 would be met by knight c3, takes rook b8. Queen b4, otherwise made on c3. And uh, yeah, this position is very good for black. So a lot of counterplay. So white took. And then he took again. And he transposed into this winning endgame. 
And okay, the rest is pretty much a mop up. Black did not defend the best, but of course, Rook takes G7 would be losing because HG and then Bishop H6. So Black had to go King H8, Rook G1, Rook E8, Knight H4, takes, and then okay, well, Black resigned because takes, Knight 6 F5. This is going to be a mop up. And the next game I want to show you guys is the game between uh, Botvinnik and Alortsov, back from 1934. So we see we're slowly but surely getting through all the world champions, for the most part. And uh, we get a Queen's Gambit declined. And Black played a slow move A6. And uh, then C6. So whenever Black plays slowly, you can keep in mind that in that case, you can actually start an attack like this with g4. That's very, very interesting move because white did not castle yet and uh, black's basically playing in a slow way. So you can actually sometimes even play in a very ambitious way. Black took on g4, but this kind of position is very good for white. Why? Because black can't even play c5, can't really even attack the queen side. And uh, white's gonna have a free ride basically on the king's side. So knight df6 was played, g6 was not holding up at all because of takes, takes, takes. And uh, this is gonna be a mating attack. So because of that, knight df6, bishop d3, knight h5, h3, strong move, threatening h takes g4. So you have to go back, bishop e5. Knight g8, now blacks basically have to play defensively. Castles queen side, knight h6, rook d g1, bishop here, queen e2, bishop f5, takes takes, and knight h4, and uh, white won very quickly. In fact, black resigned here. So you see how you can actually win in a very quick attack in the queen's game with declined, especially if black plays slowly. You can play an ambitious way with a wing attack with g4 as well. And let's look at one more example like that. And this game is between Alakine and Yates. Also a relatively famous game. And so notice how we're going from Kasparov and Carlsen, now we're going to the older world champions. But again, that's why it's important to know the classics. You can just learn a lot of new ideas from them. So Alakine, the great attacker ever, started slowly with the Queen's Gambit declined. As you have to remember, you know, just because you're an attacking player doesn't mean you can't play positional openings and then you could still find a way to attack. And you can play an exciting looking opening but still find a way to make it uh, dull and drawish. So it's like it's not so much about the opening, it's about the playing style. If you want to find interesting ideas, you can always find them. So castles, queen c2, b6. And b6 is inaccurate. Too slow and also... It just puts the bishop on a relatively passive diagonal in this case. Bishop d3, bishop b7. In some cases that plan might be okay, but usually if white's already committed to castling short, then it's maybe okay. But in this case, white plays a strong move h4. And now because this bishop is not that great, basically the c5 whole play won't be quite as effective. And because of that, it gives white really opportunity and time to attack on the king's side. So notice how it's very important that you want to do it in a slow way. And another thing to keep in mind is you don't not want to castle right away because that would allow the strong move 94, which would unload the position and liquidate somewhat. So that's why it's important to start with h4. Because now on 94, of course, you have takes, 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 and then the bishop is, of course, protected. So therefore, c5, castles queenside now, cd. Knight takes, rook e8. So I guess black opened the c-file, but he cannot really do much with it. And it turns out that white's attack is actually just quicker. King b1 first, a6, so trying to go b5 and so on. But white's quicker. g4. Knight f8 was probably the lesser of the evil, but black played b5 and that actually loses material. Why? You can pause your video to try to see if you can find it. Simple, just take on f6 g5, and white just won a pawn, because if black moves anywhere else, then h7 pawn would be hanging. So black had to do this, and then white's just winning. Up a pawn with the winning game. And maybe black was counting on bishop takes g5, 
getting the pawn back, but Alakine saw deeper. He played this very nice move, knight e6, threatening everything. So black basically had to go queen e7. Otherwise, the queen would be taken with check. So queen e7, hg, and now h7 is attacked. Black still hanging in there. He played h6. The knight on e6 is still pinned. But Alakine now transposes into a winning endgame. And uh, slowly but surely wins this endgame as well. This is all technique. White's up a pawn and has a better rook and the king. So obviously in the rook endgame if you have better pieces then it's pretty hopeless. And as you could see Alakine was good in technical positions as well. Not just attacking. And the final moment is he did not want to go king d4. That would be actually a mistake because king e6 and uh, then white would be in Zugzwang. And after e4, f4, suddenly <laughs> it might be white who is fighting for a draw. So that's why you have to be precise till the end. King d3. The idea is if king e6, then king d4, and then black's the one in Zugzwang. So even in winning pawn in games, you have to be careful till the end. But of course, Alakine manages king d7 and now e4. F4 is pretty much forced. Because king e6 loses. Because takes, takes, and then king c3. Getting to these pawns. So therefore, f4, king e2, king e6. And now, final, very important move. You know, you, you cannot make a mistake here. Otherwise, you can lose this position instead of winning. So, But of course, Alakine saw this probably when he even exchanged the rooks. Which ideally a good player should make sure that he sees all this before he offers the rook trade. So give you guys some more time. Try to see if you can find it. If you need more time, pause your video. The move is king f2. Not king f3. Because king takes e5 and black's winning. Because white's the one in Zugzwang. So king f2 and now black's forced to take on e5. And now king f3 and black resigned. So as you could see, sometimes you can play it in a very interesting way, these Carlsbad structures. You can play it with the idea of attacking on the king's side. You can play it with the idea of expanding in the center. You can combine the ideas. So it's not all just about the minority attack and the Pillsbury attack. There are a lot of other interesting ideas for white in these kind of Carlsbad structures. So that's why I wanted to cover all of them. Because it's good to know that because uh, it could be very useful. And everybody's a different type of player. Some players prefer positional play. Some players prefer attacking play. And you know, I wanted to make sure I give something for everybody. So, and then in the next couple of videos, we're going to be seeing examples where Black's going to fight back and show his own ideas how to play in Carlsbad structures against White's ideas. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And until next time, this is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman signing off. Take care.